Thank you, everybody. Um, kia ora koutou. Lovely to be here today. Lovely to be able to talk to you. Um, I'm very excited to bring my presentation, which is really looking at the setup of a new environmental research centre. Um, the good things, the bad things, uh, some of the waste and environmental solutions that we've brought, we hope, the industry. And then finally, having a look at the whole issue around funding. Uh, it's already been mentioned before by a couple of our guest keynote speakers, which is great. It's a great caveat for me. Um, so today I'm going to talk you through our journey from the very inception of our brand new centre, which was born in 2019. So our little baby, Environmental Solutions Research Centre, was born in 2019. At the beginning, there were only three of us, and there are now seven of us. And there are also over 40 different members from different universities all over the world, including Italy, America, Australia, and New Zealand. So it's been a very exciting journey for us. Now, the reason that we wanted to come together is that I'm from industry. My background is that I'm an industrialist. I started my life in the water industry and I worked there for 12 years. And so that connection has never really gone away. And what we wanted to do was start looking at industry-engaged research that actually provided solutions. Now, we realized that lots of these issues are transdisciplinary and we don't have all the answers. So we decided the best way to do it was to partner but we weren't just gonna partner with academia. We wanted to partner with industry and government too. And that was always our goal. Now, we wanted to look at tackling waste and pollution specifically in New Zealand. And I'll talk a bit about some of those things we've looked at in, in the next few slides. And we also made, made it a real key part of our job to go and start collaborating with lots of different people. So as I said, our issues are waste and pollution. And we had this ambition to find practical solutions. So the applied side of this is, yeah, we probably can't do the best blue skies research. We come from a polytechnic and that's not what we're known for. However, we can connect and we can collaborate with universities that can do that and with industry to actually set up those practical solutions that we can actually take out onto site. And that's one of the things we aim to do. Um, we realized that it would mean some new R&D, again, which we've done with, with our partners. And we realized that we needed to look at these with an economical lens on it, because actually providing an environmental solution that costs a fortune is never going to work, right? And providing an environmental solution that socially isn't acceptable or the community or the industry doesn't get on board with, it's not going to work either. So we needed to look through these three different lenses. Um, and then the, the key part, the bit that's been so tricky, and I'm going to talk about more today, is raising funds. How are we going to raise funds? How is a small polytechnic in New Zealand that's not well known necessarily for its research going to start raising funds? I hope nobody from, nobody from Unitic is watching this. Anyway, um, so what we did was we set up the ESRC and that was our structure. Um, and our structure, as you can say, it's pretty, pretty small. And we went through probably 18 months of setting up our centre, which went through all of these different phases. I'm not going to talk through them, but I can tell you it took an awful long time and we had to maintain a sense of humour while we were doing it. Eventually we got it and in 2019, we had a big party before COVID hit and we celebrated our baby. Now, the next step was, okay, we've got to find funding. Where are we going to get funding from? Who's going to fund us? You know, nobody knows who we are. We thought, let's start by doing what every other uni will do and let's go to some of these big research funds. Um, we started looking at Endeavour, the Marsden Fund and Smart Ideas and all sorts. And then we looked at the success rates. We went, yay, 10 to 13% of applicants are successful. Now, add on to that, we're a polytechnic and we can drop those by about 10%. So this was really unlikely. We knew it. Okay, we've got to be realistic here. It's applied research. Who funds applied research? Is was applied research really a big part of PBF, PBRF, or was it? Apologies, PBRF is the way that um, we gain money for some of our research from government. Um, so applied research has never really been well supported, and we know that. And we knew that there were some funds available, but they're mainly targeted at the primary industries. And we weren't really concerned with the primary industries as such. Environmental research, who cares? I mean, I hate to say it, but who does care? Unfortunately, with environmental research, it's great to do brilliant things for the environment as long as it doesn't cost. And there nearly always is a cost. So this was always gonna be a hard one. So we're a small polytechnic with applied environmental research. Right, who's going to fund us? So I put this up. I don't know how well you can see it because of the other things. Let me see if I can just get rid of it. Oh. Anybody know how to get rid of this? On the top. 
Yeah. This one? Oh, there we go. Brilliant. There we go. I put this up because I found this and I thought this is brilliant. OK, so we're trying to build all these houses in New Zealand and we've, we've got a housing crisis. Um, and so we're doing as much as we can. That's a, that's a big focus at the moment. But what's the point if you haven't got anywhere to put it? What about if you can't live on the planet because all of a sudden you have used all the resources or you've added so much waste to an environment that it's now degraded to an extent that it's no longer livable? I thought this is going to spur us to keep going. We're not giving up that easily. OK. So what we decided was, let's start by partnering with some smart people. Let's find some really good partners from around the world, from really good academic institutions, from industry who are passionate and who have knowledge and skills. And we started to do that. You can see some of our international partners here at the bottom, some of our industry collaborators here. And then in the middle are a lot of the groups that we connected with. And we started to look in three areas. We looked at indoor air quality, we looked at waste, and we looked at asbestos. And for each one of those, we went down a different funding route. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about those funding routes and why they did or didn't work. So indoor air quality, um, this little thing here, this little gizmo is something called the WISP. And we designed it ourselves at Unitech, designed, built, made. I spent hours helping to put together those fabric cases, believe me, <laughs> it wasn't fun. We had 200 of them. And they're there to measure indoor air quality. Now, we started to look at that because we were quite intrigued by the fact that our construction and trade school are making these houses on site and we thought well, let's go and do some testing in the houses let's go and find out what's actually going on when you get that lovely new furniture smell and we took two houses identical houses and we furnished them completely from scratch and then we threw our sensors in to see what happened to the chemicals inside the house what could we measure um appreciating that a lot of the off-gassing from furniture can put chemicals into your airspace. And when you start to make your home airtight, of course, you're locking all those things in. So we started to look at where they might be coming from. And we looked at two different things in particular. We looked at VOCs, which are volatile organic compounds. And they come from things like drying your hair, deodorant, cooking, all those sorts of things they create. Those. And the other thing is particulate matter which generally comes from outside, but things like burning fuels, coal fires, car exhausts um, are main contributors. And they do us harm, they're not good for us. So we started to look in a bit more detail. We looked inside and outside, that's the outside profile. And you can see there that when everybody's been driving home um, over here, you see a little peak after the evening traffic and also a peak that occurs when we start burning fires. Um, and that's the outside one. The inside one was also pretty scary. So we had a number of different studies. Excuse me, I'm going to start with this one. The first study looked, as I said, is our identical homes. And we furnished them. And what we found when we looked inside was that if we didn't have any mechanical ventilation on, and these were a mixture of airtight and um, less airtight homes. So the test there was our really airtight home and the control there was our less airtight home, just just a standard timber build. When we didn't have mechanical ventilation on, our airtight home gave us quite a lot of VOCs, over 400 microgram per meter cubed. What does that mean? Well, there's no consent in New Zealand for this, but in Europe, the consent's 200. So you, it's double, okay. so that's not good. But when we put the air condition, we put the mechanical ventilation on, we're all right, we're down at low levels. That makes sense, right? We all know that. Put your ventilation on. So let's have a show of hands. How many people in this room put your ventilation on every time you cook? Every time. One. Good. Thank you for proving that. So we realised that, yes, we know that it does good things to make sure that we're ventilating, but are people doing it? Not necessarily. So the next step was we need to go out into the community and start actually using this to educate. So we've gone through an awful lot of iterations of the same project and the last one sponsored by HRV, thank you very much, um, took us out into industry where we actually took, sorry, into public homes, where we took our sensors and we put them across 15 homes across Auckland and Hamilton. And we looked at what does their air quality look like before and after the installation of mechanical ventilation and how can we help people to get better outcomes in their indoor space. That project's still ongoing. We'll continue to do that for the next two years a really successful industry funded project as far as we're concerned, but it wasn't easy. Then another picture just to show you that the indoor air sensors pick up some quirky stuff, that graph at the side there, you see that huge peak? That huge peak came from a sensor inside a building, fireworks night. All right, waste. Now waste was a project that was an academic and an industrial partnership. 
And what we've been doing is working to look at how we can get practical solutions on site to source separate and then to get our plastics into a recycling process or actually into a reuse type process. And believe you me, it's so much harder than it sounds. We've got a huge amount of waste coming from this sector. That's no surprise. We all know that. And a lot of that waste um, comes from, uh, that comes from the construction sector is plastic. Uh, plastic, mainly PVC, but there's also high density polyethylene and polypropylene coming in. And our project was looking at auditing on site. So going out and taking every single waste item and with that waste item, working out what it is, how much it weighs, what its volume is when it goes into landfill, and then where does it come from? So that was our project. From our study so far, we're estimating that we're contributing about 25,000 tonnes from Auckland alone of plastic to landfill from construction. Now, if you add on the building that we'd like to do in terms of new houses, that number's going up. All right. So our plastic waste minimisation project is in collaboration with, listen to these fabulous people, Auckland Council, Naylor Love, thank you, Naylor Love, Mitre 10 and Brands. We're very lucky to be sponsored. And then a whole load of other people who have come in to help out, Sustainable Business Network, lots of people involved because this is a real issue and we want to find a solution. So we've done our auditing. This is our auditing car park. You can see the waste that we collected and every bit was taken out of the skip, including the wrappers of um, chicken breasts. That was nice after four months of being in a skip and laid out on the floor and they were photographed, sampled, analysed using spectrometry, um, weighed and then, OK, well now we know what they are. Where do we put them? That was our plan. Now, another bit of audience participation, please. Two things we wanted to know, what type of plastics, because that tells us how we can recycle them or if. And number two, stage. Where did they come from? What were they being used for? So type was easy. We could analyze everything and we found out in, our in, in this instance, and this was a commercial site, four actually, 76% was polyethylene. Hey, that's gonna be tricky because that polyethylene, yes, you can recycle it, but a lot of it's dirty. A lot of it's contaminated with dust and cement and all sorts. And that makes it hard. Anyway, we'll come back to that. Stage. All right, so we, we have three categories. And I'm going to ask you here, and audience, audience down online, the 12 of you, you don't get away from it that easy. You're going to join us in this. So I want you to put your hand up if you are online and show us what you think. Three places the wastes come from. Number one, offcuts. Construction components produce a lot of plastic waste. Number two, Building wrap, building protection. You've all seen the houses with the wrap around it. You know what I mean? That's number two. And number three, packaging. Packaging the screws that come in and the, all the bits that come in from, from Mitre 10 and the other suppliers, okay? Three places. So who in the room thinks that most of the plastic came from offcuts? Put your hand up if you think it came from offcuts. And we need these gallery people. Where are our gallery gone? There we go. Come on, people online. There you go. Thank you. We've got one. All right, not many. How many people think that it came from building wrap? Not many. How many people think it came from packaging? Oh, <laughs> do you know you're my favorite audience ever? Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for playing back at home. All right, here's your answer. Interesting, isn't it? We all have this idea. I was exactly the same, by the way. I'm not gonna lie to you. I thought the same, it's all packaging, right? No, it's not all packaging. It's really not all packaging. We have got just as much of a problem from things like our building protection and our offcuts. And the great thing about that is we can do something about it. Now we, now we know what it is. I'll tell you all about that later on, maybe over a coffee. So we thought we're gonna start with a new system. We are gonna go with refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle. And the refuse is we're gonna go back to suppliers and say, can you stop wrapping it with that? Do you really need to wrap it with that? Can we get rid of some of this stuff? That was our first step. So offcuts, we started talking to manufacturers and being a real pain in the backside and saying, can you take this back? Can you take the offcut? But don't take it back and put it in the bin because that's not solving it. Take it back and make it into a new product. And unbelievably, so many people went, yeah, all right. Cool. Good, that's one. Naila Love. Annie's going to come and talk to you later on, I believe, tomorrow, and uh, she's an inspiration. And she helped us with raising awareness on site and how do we incentivize and how do we get people on board and excited. If anybody can get construction guys excited, it's Annie. Um, and we started to look at, well, what, where are some of the plastics coming that we can do something about so they don't get to site? 
one of the things that we came up with was designing timber pack covers so that timber now goes to all Naylor Love sites without packaging. Then they put the tarpaulin on, and when it's all used, they take the tarpaulin off and it's ready for the next lot that's delivered. And finally, and this is our favorite little bit, we like this one. Mitre 10 decided that they'd never really asked their customers if they wanted packaging or not. And so they decided to trial it online. And on their online train orders over a year, they had over 13,000 different orders go through. And they added this special little button. Oh, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. They added this special little button, which we like to call the magic button. Here's the magic button. And what it says is, no, I do not wish these products to be wrapped. Yes, I want these products to be wrapped. And it's been set up so that you have to actively go and press yes. It's automatically on no. And you know the really good news? Oh, God, I'm so sorry. How do I share again? Go on, share screen. Thank you. Thank you. So the result was in a year, 97% of all online orders went out unwrapped. Isn't that incredible? Well done, Mighty 10. 97%, 13,000 orders, none of them went wrapped in plastic. That's the solution. All right, finally, hazardous waste. We started to look at, we've got vast uh, volumes of asbestos contaminated waste going to landfill. And some of that waste is one or two fibers in masses of soil and the whole lot gets wrapped in plastic and buried in landfill. It's not sustainable. There must be another option. And the other option was to start looking at, believe it or not, can we bioremediate this? Is it possible to break down asbestos fibers? Can our natural biota carry out this for us? Well, good indication from other, other universities doing the blue skies research that we're not so good at, but fabulous stuff is if you put an asbestos fiber into a Petri dish with certain fungi, you start to see changes that reduce how carcinogenic it is. Fab, eh? So we thought, well, let's see if we can build a plant to do it. And here's our plant. We built this plant at Unitech, um, and it's basically looking at soil conditions so that we can start trialing bioremediation in the future. This has been funded by the MFE. This is a good example of us going and getting the academic funding we so craved. But the only way we got that was to combine with other top experts from around the world. We decided that we needed a little bit of publicity. Don't get me wrong, if you're looking for academic funding, everybody, and you're going for the big funders, make sure that you are connected well with media and government and everybody else, because it makes a really good story, right? Now, I didn't shave my hair to get funding. Honestly, I didn't. I shaved my hair to raise money for the Cancer Society, and I raised $10,000 doing that, um, because what I wanted to do was continue the story that asbestos is still part of our environment. It's not an old fashioned contaminant. It's still here. We might not be importing it anymore, but it is still here. It's still a lot of our building stock, and we need to be aware of that. So as well as finding bioremediation solutions, we wanted to raise awareness and start giving this information, especially to the trade sector, so that we could stop exposure and reduce some of those cases of asbestos-related diseases. So we've done a lot of awareness raising in different countries all over the world. We've been taught uh, the trade sector at Unitech. They all have asbestos awareness training now. Um, so that's another part of what we do. It's really about outreach and it's really about making a difference. So summarizing pros and cons. When you're looking at academic, the pros is that it's never really very successful, except unbelievably, we've had 43% of our funding applications approved. And I think that comes down from partnership. That's all I can put it down to. The funders tend to be really brought onto the project because they've got a vested interest in it being successful and that's nice. And I found that one, lead fund, one fund leads to another. The cons, you all know, anybody here who's done a funding application, oh my goodness, I say no more. You often need help and advice just to fill in the first page. And they are a one-shot wonder. You spend hours, days, weeks preparing it to be told no six months later is quite demoralizing. We have had funds canceled, but smart ideas, twice. Um, and the ongoing reporting is quite tough. And often they ask for a cash contribution. Where are we gonna get a cash contribution from? So that's just a list of the funders that we've had from academia who have, thank you very much to MFE and Brands, funded us very kindly. Now, in terms of industrial partnerships, 
the pros are there's no structured process for this for many industrial partners. They just really want to know what we can do and what we can offer. There's no horrible application form. It's applied research and we love that. We're actually going out and doing applied research in homes with communities. Again, once they like you, they like you and that's good and it does help with reputation. And you don't need quite the same amount of reporting. Um, so we've got some high impact applied research going on and we're dealing with real people in industry. So far, we have had 100% success. We've never applied for industrial fund and not got it. These are our funders, thank you very much again. But the cons, this is the big one, right? We all go down the industrial route, it's too good to be true. It is too good to be true. You have to remain impartial. You're not there to go and test a product for your funders. That's not how it works. You test a process, but you, you don't test a product because that's not what we do in academia. Yeah. That's quite hard. Um, they don't tolerate overheads for anyone who's written an application. Overheads come in from your institution. They're often very high and industry don't tolerate that. It doesn't make you very popular at work. Um, it's exhausting because in actual fact, you are a continual game show host and it is exhausting. I'm not going to tell you a lie. So the future, the future of ESRC, what does it look like for us? I've got one minute left. I think I'm about there. We love what we do. And part of the reason we love what we do is we've seen a difference. The other reason we love what we do is that we directly feed this back to our students. All of our students know all about our waste programs. They all have asbestos awareness. They understand the issues and they understand all about indoor air quality. They know how to use the sensors. They go out and they do teaching in schools with us. We do voluntary teaching to um, intermediate schools. So our students are part of this. And I think that's great because the next workforce is going to know this stuff. And it's all practical stuff. We've had some accomplishments that make us smile because everybody needs somebody to pat you on the back and say you're doing well, don't they? So we've hosted a few quite cool conferences between us. There's our little team of girls who've been working on the construction project. We've got Julie Roberts from Mitre 10, Annie, who you're going to see tomorrow from Layla Love, and Linda Kessel. Um, so that, that's our little waste team. And we've hosted a few different conferences, been on the radio, that was exciting, been in magazines, that's cool as well. And as I said, some lovely awards come through. Um, so we've won different awards for our work that's actually gone out and made a difference to the environment and hopefully to our communities. And that was always the objective of what we're doing. But the best part of this, this is my favorite baby, the mesothelioma support and asbestos awareness. Yes, I'm sorry, it's a long, long, long one. Um, mesothelioma is a cancer that's caused by asbestos. And we set up a trust. It was born on the 2nd of February this year. And that trust will be there to raise funds and we will support people with mesothelioma. Um, it's never been set up before in New Zealand. We don't have one. They are all over the world except here. Um, and this has been done by the team and I, and we're very excited about it. So if anybody wants to support in any way, please let us know. We'd be very grateful. Um, the idea is that we're connecting up people who have no voice with each other and providing some support for a disease that's not really very curable. Okay, so our conclusions. We're pretty well connected now with industry and that's led to some really cool long-term collaborations. And we have demonstrated that we can address environmental solutions, issues and come up with solutions that are practical. And that really excites us. Industry funding has been such a blessing and we thank our funders so much for what they've given to us. But it has highlighted that we need to be more than, can I say, your standard academic. We need to be able to talk and communicate and engage on such a higher level. And that's been quite hard. We have raised the profile, I think, on environmental concerns. And we, in doing so, we've met with so many other like-minded people from so many other sectors, which has been fun, but it's also been really important to giving us opportunities to be able to go and make a difference. Opportunities with people like Annie from Naila Love, from Nigel from Benjamin Residential, who's letting us on his site on a weekly basis to audit stuff and get in the way. Um, and that does strengthen our funding chances. So ESRC is a pretty dynamic research centre that I hope will continue to grow and hope will continue to provide some solutions. And the idea really eventually is to develop into a centre that's nationally recognised as leading environmental applied research. Just want to say a huge thank you to all of those people that have supported us, supported us and given us a chance. And thank you all for listening.